Okay, so just to review, what were we doing last time? Last time we were discussing, we introduced the graphics pipeline, okay, which is the main steps of which are represented by this diagram here. Okay. Now this diagram here is going from what we call, well, from on the left hand side we've kind of got the abstract model of the virtual environment, which is represented inside the computer by various vector data, vector data. On the right hand side we've got a final image on a computer screen of a realistic um, perspective projected image on the on the on the computer screen of, of this little village environment. So the graphics pipeline describes kind of all the steps you go through the computer goes through to produce the final produce the final image. Now some of the steps, especially figure you know applying textures to the faces of the buildings there. By textures, we mean either colors or images to the, you know, surface feature images to the faces of the buildings, things like that. Things, uh, hidden surface deletion, the fact that for the computer to figure out which things are in front of which other things in the in, in the in the in the view, and so not to draw things. So we'll just be producing, we won't be producing images as good as this final one uh, in our last two assignments, but rather more kind of wireframe models in which you'll be able to see, you know, all the buildings will be transparent and you'll be able to see the ones that lie behind other ones. But we'll be doing, dealing with the alignment and the uh, projection uh, parts of this, okay? Now we talked through this in detail uh, last time. And in particular, we talked about how we do the alignment. Okay? So we have our abstract 3D model inside the computer. And to produce a view of it, you have to specify the crucial information of where the camera is or where the eye of the observer is in the environment and which direction they're looking. Okay? Because that will determine what needs to be drawn. Okay? And the first step in the the first main stage in getting towards the in getting towards the final uh, screen image was to align the environment. Okay, so before in we have to get the environment ready to do the projection phase. So so that that's called aligning the environment, and that means having the viewpoint positioned at the origin of the XYZ coordinate system. The viewpoint position at the origin and the direction of view will always be down along the z-axis. Okay, because remember the conventions for computer graphics is that we've got our left-handed XYZ coordinate system. The X and Y coordinates are the horizontal and vertical axis of the screen, and the z-axis is disappearing straight into the screen away from you. Okay, and the viewpoint is represented in the center of the screen. So, so the origin between the X and Y axes is 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 in the center of the screen. So we discussed that last time, how we do that. And we did that using a rotation sequence, which we described uh, in an earlier, well, we described the idea, the, the concept of doing uh, rotation sequences in an, in an earlier chapter. Okay. So the first stage in the alignment was doing a, a translation to drag the viewpoint to the origin. Okay, so that gets the viewpoint at the origin, but then the direction of view vector would then be general. And then you do two rotations, a rotation around the x-axis, sorry, a rotation around the y-axis, followed by a rotation around the x-axis to bring the viewing direction vector down onto the z-axis. And once that is done, then the environment is aligned, and then you're ready for the projection stage, which is here. So that's what we're going to start, uh, start discussing now. Now, in, now, there's various ways to do projection. So projection is the term that's used to, to describe the process where you take your three-dimensional system. Okay, so we're modeling a three-dimensional environment. So the vertices of our buildings 
the, the points of interest in our environment, they're represented by points in free space. But of course, the screen is only two-dimensional. So projection is the process where you take your three-dimensional data and convert it into two-dimensional data, which can then be sent to the screen in some way and just plotted as points on the two-dimensional plane of the screen. Okay? There's a number of ways to do this. The very simplest way to do this is so-called orthographic projection. So orthographic projection is where you, you have your point in three dimensions, which has an x, y, and a z coordinate. And remember, the x and y coordinates are the horizontal and vertical coordinates of the screen. So orthographic projection is where you take your point with three coordinates, x, y, and z, and you simply forget about the z coordinate. You just use the x and y coordinates that it has and plot those x and y coordinates on the screen. So you're losing, in, completely losing the information of where the point is along the z-axis. Okay? You're just using the information about where it is, um, where it is with regard to x and y. Okay? Now we can think about that as the process of making the z-coordinate of all points equal to zero. Okay? And so we can ha then have a, a matrix which represents that transformation then, which will be this matrix P here. So this matrix P, and remember it's a 4 by 4 matrix because we're using homogeneous coordinates. And you'll notice that it's the identity matrix except for the fact that it's missing its 1 in the third row and column. Yeah? So it's got 1's along the main diagonal except in the third row and column position. Okay? So when you, when you take that matrix and multiply it by any um, any vector x, y, z in homogeneous coordinates, it is going to have the effect of making the z coordinate equal to zero, and it will keep the x and y coordinates the same, and keep the fourth uh, homogeneous coordinate the same. Okay. So this process is represented visually in this diagram on the following page, okay, which shows a typical process of an orthographic projection. So this kind of arrow-shaped object, or it's maybe a very shallow house object. Here is the object on, on the right-hand side. Here is the object in the three-dimensional environment on, on the right-hand side. Here over on the left is the xy plane. So you can think of that as the plane of the screen. Okay. Um, so quite simply, you know, these, the vertices of the, of the house object in the environment, they have x and y coordinates, and they also have z coordinates, a certain distance along the, along the z axis. But if we just chuck away the z coordinate, or make the z coordinate zero for, for every vertex, the, you can visualize that geometrically as projecting every object in the space perpendicularly onto the x, y plane. Um, of the screen. Okay. So that's the orthographic orthographic projection. Now, the <coughs> properties of the orthographic <coughs> projection are listed here, um, and these these properties are some of them are advantages or disadvantages depending on the context or what you might want from this orthographic uh, projection. So when you, when you perform orthographic projection, all objects, when you look at the, the projected image onto the xy plane, the projected image will still have the same dimensions in the x and y coordinate directions as the original objects. Okay? So this projection of our, of our house, it has the same width and height as the original house, the same x and y extent as, as the original house. It has no z extent because it's just an image in the xy plane. But its size in the x and y directions is of the projected image is exactly the same as the x and y size of the of the of the actual object in the in the world. <coughs> so that means you don't have any you don't have any size information to give you an impression of depth. 
Okay, if there was a second house in this image, if there was a second house of the same size but a lot further away from the xy plane, it would get projected forward onto the xy plane as well. And if the the two houses in the real environment had the same size, their projected images would be the same size. Even though one of them was much further away from the observer, it was located at z equals zero. Okay. So that might be a that might be an advantage or a dis or a disadvantage. It's, it's an advantage in the sense that the images on the projected screen are realistic, in the sense that their size exactly matches the size of the object in the environment. But it's maybe a disadvantage is there's no none of that relative size uh, information to tell you which objects are further away and which objects are closer to the viewer. Okay. So some other aspects of it is that um, lines that were parallel in the, in the world space they remain parallel in the projection. Okay, so the the parallel nature of lines in the real world is preserved under orthographic projection. Angles can often be estimated accurately. At least if you're talking about an angle in in an in an x y plane located at some z position, that will be replicated accurately in the orthographic projection. And this kind of information, if you look at a line in the projection, you know, the scale along the line remains constant. So if you're looking at a line in the projection and you see two points along the line that are one centimeter apart, say, on the screen, if you look further down that line, if two points are one, one centimeter apart, those are points that are the same distance apart in the actual real world. Okay? So the kind of scale is constant. Now these properties are advantageous in, in, in situations where you want to be able to tell the actual size of objects. So for instance, they're off, the, the orthographic projection is often used in technical drawings that, that you might encounter in architecture or in product design, you know, designing three-dimensional objects or you know, engineering design and so on, okay? where you want plans of the objects, the, the buildings and architecture or the machines and engineering design, where you want plans that accurately reflect the size of the objects. Mm -hmm. So you can make measurements on the projection and the, on the plan, on the page, you can make measurements on the page that you could that ac accurately represent real sizes or distances in the real world on, on the object. Okay? So you often see these projections used there. Okay? But of course, for the terms of, say, producing a view of a three-dimensional environment for the purposes of a computer game, some of these properties are disadvantages. Okay? So if the, the projection of a three-dimensional environment for the purposes of a computer game should show an approximately realistic view of the environment that you would have if you were in that environment. All these games where, where you're controlling you know, a person, who, yourself, in the game, moving around the environment. Well, the image on the screen should be a rough approximation or a good approximation of what you, what, uh, what you would actually see were you in a real situation. Okay. So of course, when, when we're in the real, real world, I look at the people in the back row, they appear smaller than the people in the front row. Okay. That's just the way we perceive, perceive images. So we want objects that are far away from the viewpoint to be smaller relatively than objects that are closer to the viewpoint. Okay? So that information isn't contained in the orthographic uh, projection. Okay? So it's, it's not the usual projection that we're familiar to, familiar, uh, that we're used to seeing in these kind of, uh, in these kind of, uh, virtual environment, say, in the context of a, of, a, of a computer game. Now, related to the orthographic projection is a related one, which is called the oblique projection. So orthographic projection is this first situation we looked at, where the projection takes place parallel to the z-axis. Okay? So you have the aligned environment, 
the, the viewer is thought of being positioned at the origin looking down the z-axis and the projection happens parallel to the z-axis. But in other situations you, you might not want to project along that direction. You might want to alter the direction you project along. Okay? Because for instance in the orthographic projection because this house is lined up so that these side walls are parallel to the z-axis, under when the when you get the projection, that whole side little side wall of the house all gets projected to this line. So you, you lose all information that there might have been on that side wall. You can't see any of the features of it in the projection. Whereas if you did want to did want to be able to observe that side wall of the house, rather than project parallel to the z-axis, you could choose a direction of projection which is not parallel to the z. Okay, so if you projected it out still towards the xy plane, but not parallel to the z-axis, but instead at an angle to the z-axis, then the projected image you would the, the side wall would still survive in, in the projected image. It wouldn't be collapsed completely onto this uh, solid line here. So that kind of projection is called an oblique projection. So there we have a projection vector D, which is a vector in the, it's a three-dimensional vector in the environment. And the, the oblique projection happens uh, so that the, every point is sent on a line parallel to that direction D. And then wherever that line intersects the, the xy plane, that's where the projected point is, uh, that's where the projected point is drawn. Okay. Now similar to the orthogonal projection, we can represent oblique projection using a matrix as well. A projection matrix here. Okay, can you see there's information here regarding the x, y, and z components of the projection vector D, which feature in the matrix uh, in the matrix P. And in a similar way to the orthographic projection, this this projection matrix carries out the perspective uh, projection. So maybe we should just do a little confirmation of this. So this exercise 7.1 asks us just to confirm. Confirm that these matrices are indeed are indeed the correct ones. Um, so I'll just do a quick working through that now. Okay. So first of all, uh, we'll go back to the orthographic uh, projection. I mean, this, I mean, there's really not a huge amount to, to confirm here. But if you have a vector x, which is in your in, in the world, then so x we'll think of as having coordinates x1, x2, x3, and 1. So it's got, it's represented in homogeneous coordinates. <coughs> Then when you take this matrix, so Px, remember our matrix P was like the identity matrix, except it was it had a zero in the third position down the diagonal. Everything else was zero. Uh, zero there, zero there, zero there, zero there. All the other entries zero. When you multiply that by the vector x1, x2, x3, x1. <coughs> Well, you do the matrix multiplication, and you see it gives you exactly x1, x2, 0, 1. So this is just confirming that it does carry out the orthographic projection. So our vector in the environment, which could have any x, y, and z coordinates, is now rendered into a vector which is 0 z coordinate and still has its same original x1 and x, uh, x and y coordinates. So this vector here is certainly an element of the xy plane painted <coughs> at z equals 0. The plane described by the x and y axes at, at the origin, at the value z equals 0. So P is indeed, uh, is indeed the orthographic projection matrix. Thank <laughs> you. 
<coughs> so, I mean, there's not a huge amount of confirmation to be there at that. Um, for the oblique projection, there's maybe a little bit more to check. So the form of the matrix is given there in the notes, and really we just need to draw a, an accurate enough sketch of the situation to just to confirm that that matrix does does have the does have the correct form. So we'll draw um, we'll draw the x one we'll draw the x entering. So this is an overhead view, an overhead view of the setup. <laughs> the x-axis and the z-axis. And in this kind of view, remember the, the y-axis is going to be coming perpendicularly off the page, straight at you. And that gives you the, yeah, that's the left hand. Remember, it's your thumb is x, your first finger is y, the middle finger is z. Um, so thumb is going in the x direction, y is coming straight off at you, and the z-axis is going so this is looking down at the situation from above. So the screen is located here. The screen is the xy plane at z equals 0. We can't actually see the image on the screen because the screen is just this plane which is coming you know, vertically out of the page. Okay. This, is the, this is the projection screen which is located here. Uh, and this is the, you know, the environment that we're looking at is over here and we're going to project it onto the screen, but it's coming and um, we've got a projection vector D. So D, the projection vector, will say has components dx, dy, dz. So here's a point, here's a point, well, let's see, here's a point x environment. Using x to the vector is a little bit confusing. Uh, the x axis, let's just use u. Let's that out. So u is a point in the environment. So the oblique projection should send u, should send u to this point here. P times u. <coughs> so u is the point out in the environment, and in its oblique projection, it should go parallel to the vector d, uh, parallel to the vector d. Parallel to the vector D uh, until it hits the screen. But really, what you see, really, what we're looking at there is not the vector D, but the projection of vector D to the to the x plane. The real vector D in the environment might be sticking up something like this. Okay, but what you can see there on this top-down view is the projection of D to the to the x y to the x z plane. So that's the projection projection of d to the x z plane. But we can accurately see here the components d x and d z of d. So d x is the component, <coughs> the component of d along the x axis, and d z is the component of d along along the uh, Along the uh, along the z axis. Now our vector u will have the vector u in the world has its original x coordinate here, and its projected point is down here. And so you can think of the you can think of the difference between them as being this length here. So that this length along the x axis between the coordinate coordinate of the original point u, which I'll call u sub x, and uh, the x-coordinate of its projected uh, point. Well, we just observed, we just observed that the projection line, the projector, so the projection line, the line, this is mentioned in the notes, I might mean, mentioned it yeah, in the lecture, the line, the straight line between the original point in the environment, <coughs> joining it to its uh, projected image, that's called the projector line. So this projector line 
has a gradient, because it's parallel to the d vector, it has the same gradient as d in the x set plane. So it has the gradient dx over dz. That's the slope of this, the slope of this line. So you think of that, that's the change in the x coordinate proportional to the change in the z coordinate. Now that's, that's kind of like an inverse gradient. The gradient is changing y proportional to change. So that's like, sorry, that's called that inverse gradient. Different, I mean, it's still a measure of the gradient, but it's the reciprocal of what we normally call a gradient. Because when we look at a graph like this, we normally turn the gradient of a line to be the change in the vertical coordinate relative to a change in the horizontal coordinate. But that's just a convention. Equally well, you can still measure the same quantity by talking about the change in the horizontal coordinate relative to the change in the vertical coordinate. Um, so, what, so what's the actual length of this? this distance down here, so ux gets changed by the quantity minus dx dz times u of z. Okay. So dx over dz is the kind of relative change of the x-coordinate relative to the change in the z-coordinate. Our original uh, point U in the environment had a z coordinate u z. So when it gets projected, the this distance along the x axis that we're going to have to move to get to the projected point is minus the x z over over u z. This is the sign of distance. So it tells us to to decrease u x by by this amount. And all we, all we do to confirm the projection matrix is just check that this is what the projection matrix actually carries out. So we'll check that this agrees with, this agrees with the matrix in the notes. So the matrix in the notes to work out PU so P was 1, 0, and you've got, see, this is why we have this term minus dx d over dz. And then 0, 1, and then you have minus dy over dz, and 0, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So this large matrix multiplied by the original point, so ux, u, u, y, u, z, <coughs> one. Is that a notation for our general point? So this is the matrix from the notes multiplied by our general vector u, represented as that column vector there with the homogeneous coordinates. <coughs> so when you multiply this out, what is the coordinate in the first position? Well, you see you get ux minus dx dz times dz. And in the y coordinate, you get uy, you get a similar thing, uy minus dy dz times dy, sorry, dz. You get a 0 third coordinate and a 1 as the fourth coordinate. So this, this x, x component of that vector agrees with the one that we derived just looking at the, at the projection diagram a few moments ago, which was that minus dx dz times the component uz, that was the amount we had to move along the x-axis from the original x-coordinate to get to the x-coordinate of the, of the projected, of, of the, the image of the projection. Is everybody okay with that yeah. multiplication of the matrices there? Okay. And drawing a similar diagram, drawing a 
similar diagram of the YZ plane, i.e. a side view, When do you see the YZ plane? You see the YZ plane when you're standing over to the side here. You can see the, oops, you can see the screen here located at Z equal to zero, um, and you can see the Y axis extending up, but you can't see the X axis because the X axis is coming straight up. So you can't see the X axis of the screen. I can see the Y axis and I can see the Z axis going to the right in, in, into the environment. So there I'd be able to look at the Y and Z components of the projection direction D. And again, that would allow me to confirm this second entry. A similar direction of the Y Z plane, side view of the projection setup. This will confirm the first second entry. Okay, so that's orthographic and oblique projections. They're not typically used in a kind of computer graphics set, well, in, in, in this kind of computer game scenario. We, as I said, in the computer game scenario, we want some kind of a projection which more or less coincides with the kind of the way we perceive the real environment. Okay. Orthographic projection is quite different to that. <coughs> in your orthographic projection, a house a mile away in the real environment would get projected, and its projected image would have the size of the size that it, the house actually has, so the same height and width that it actually has when it's brought to the, brought to the projection. Okay. And that information can be useful technically when you're, you know, when you're doing technical study of the environment, like in architecture or in design, manufacturing design, where you want your pictures. You don't necessarily want the pictures to look nice and you know to look kind of like a realistic view of the thing. You might want them to actually have the correct <coughs> size information on them. So you can make measurements of the diagram and they will can be easily translated into the actual distances that uh, are in the real world. So um, the main topic which is to be the perspective. Okay. So once we've got that out of the way, we're we're ready to ready now to look at perspective projection. Okay, so I'll just get the notes back up on the screen. So I've got this picture from Father Ted here. Have mm -hmm. you seen this episode, Hell, where they go to holiday in the caravan in the wonderful Irish holiday park somewhere in the west of Ireland? Um, but just for those of you who haven't seen, is, is there anybody here who hasn't seen Father Ted? Who doesn't know the setup? You've never seen it? Never seen it? Okay. Well, it's, about the, it's a light-hearted comedy, Irish comedy, about these three priests living and they're kind of three dysfunctional priests in various ways and so they've been banished by the church to live far out in the west of Ireland away from anybody they could uh, trouble too much. These two characters are Ted and Dougal. Ted is dysfunctional because he got he, he, he had some money resting in his account. He basically did some financial fiddle in the church so that's why he was exiled. This priest over here, Dougal is, well he's, he's a He's a, he's a simpleton, I guess. He's uh, a poor soul who, who isn't very intellectually gifted, and that's his main source of comedy with Dougal in, uh, in the thing. Um, and it, they, they went on holiday, and the weather was terrible, and they were stuck in this tiny caravan. And this scene showed, well, it was, it was, it was only about a second or two long, but Ted was <coughs> explaining to Dougal about these cows, and he was trying to, con trying to explain Google's view of the world that these cows were small, they're 
small little toy cows. But the cows you could see in the fields out the window were far away. But Dougal couldn't get his head around this. And he was still perplexed by the fact that the, the cows in the field far away looked to be the same size as these cows. So were the ones outside toys, or, or were these real cows? That was you know, his miss. His failure to grasp all this was the uh, was the source of the comedy. Thing. But uh, quite a funny one. The episode is called Hell. If you want to watch it, that's what holidays in the west of Ireland are like. Um, sometimes. So this is, of course, so why do the cows outside in the fields look small? They look small because they are far away. And that's the way our perception works. Of course, when you stop to think about it, you know, maybe it's, it's that's, our perception works that way because of, well, because of how our perception works, how, how, how the image gets from outside in the world into our minds. Um, and it is a, maybe a, a, a legitimate question. When I look at a cow that's in a field far away, why don't I see the cow as being, whatever, five feet long and four feet tall, however tall the cow is? Why don't I perceive that? Why, why does it look small? Well, I mean, of course, the, the explanation for this is how the, how the human eye actually works. Okay? Now, of course, I don't know exactly how the human eye works, and that's not the subject of this course, but a very simplified view of it, very simplified view of it is, is we think of our pupil, the pupil you know, where, where the actual light enters, enters into your eye, we're, we're going to think of that as a point, as a single point. Okay? So the light rays, the light from the sun, or the source of light, whatever, the light rays bounce off objects in the world, and a, an array of light gets reflected towards our eye. And the ray of light enters into your eye through the pupil. Okay? And it then travels through your eye until it hits the back of your eye. Until it hits your retina. And on your, so that's the back wall of your eyeball. And there, there are light-sensitive cells which receive the light and send a signal to your brain. So actually, on the back wall of your eye, is a projected image of the outside scene. Now it actually becomes upside down because you know if, if you've got a light ray coming from a high object towards my eye and a light ray coming from a low down object towards my eye, the light rays cross at my pupil and so the light ray from the low down object ends up at the top of my retina and the light ray from the high up object ends up at the bottom of my retina. So it's actually an upside down image at the back of your eye of course, your brain just becomes a right ways up image when it goes through to your brain. So, you know, at a at a at a very at a very um, at a very rough viewpoint, that's that's how the eye works. Now, we are going to reproduce that in order to produce our uh, perspective uh, perspective projection. So in, in that view of how the eye works, the projection plane is actually behind the viewpoint. So thinking as if, you're, as if your eyeball or as if, if the observer is positioned at the origin, how it actually happens in our bodies, the, projected, the projection plane is behind the viewpoint. But that's not how we're going to think of it now to set up, our, to set up the mathematics of our perspective projection. Here we're going to think of the projection plane as being in front of the observer. Now, there's, an, there's an, an analogy for what's going on here. If the scene is out there in the virtual world in front of me, and I'm the observer here, and I want to produce a perspective projection of it, I mean, we could, if I had more resources, I might have actually done this. But you, imagine bringing in a huge sheet of glass, OK? So that's the, the sheet of glass is representing the projection plane. And I set that at a certain distance away from me, but close to me, and if I fix the position of my eye, let's say I close one eye, so I you know, simplify it down. So I'll, I just have one eye open, I have the sheet of glass in front of me, so I can see the, I can see the objects in the world the other side of the glass. And if I keep my, the position of my eye fixed, if I rest my chin on a chin rest here or something, so my eye isn't moving, and then I then get a, 
then get a marker pen. And I simply draw on the glass, I draw the outline of all the objects in the world. Okay? So I can see a house the other side of the glass, so I do an outline drawing of exactly the house as I can see, but I do the drawing on the glass, on the on the glass plane in front of me. Okay? And then the object over here, I draw, you know, I'll see that in a certain way. So I trace around the image as I see it falling on the glass with my pen. Well, that's exactly in in a nutshell, in a non-mathematical way, non-mathematical explanation, that's exactly what uh, perspective projection is. If after I've done all my drawing, if I then take the if I then if I then take the sheet of glass, stick it up against the blank wall, stick it up against the blank white wall, you'll be able, all be able to look at the image and it will look like a realistic representation of what I what I could actually see when I was tracing them. Okay? You'll 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 have a realistic image of image on the glass there of what I could see. And of course, if I'm looking at a cow in a field very distant, it will appear very small to me. So when I draw the outline of the cow on the glass, it will be a small little cow. If there's a cow right in front of me, the other side of the glass plane, and that will appear really big on the glass. Okay? So it will have that perspective information in it. Objects that are very far away will be relatively small on the projection. Objects that are close will be relatively large. Okay? So we want to carry this out mathematically. We want to uh, figure out what's going on so that we can implement it on the computer. Okay? So the com computer can take, we can provide the computer with the specification of the objects that are in the world, the three-dimensional positions of points, how to, what points to draw, what, what collections of points to use as the boundaries of the polygons, and then by building up the image using loads of polygons, you can build a realistic three-dimensional model. Then we want the computer to be able to do, to calculate the perspective projection. Okay. So in this situation here, it's modeled. So we're simplifying things down. We were, suppose we just got one object in the scene. So we again got our house type object. Here's our viewpoint. We're, we're assuming the, the world has already been aligned. So the viewpoint is at the origin of the x, y, z axis. And we're looking straight down the z axis. So the, the center of view, we're looking straight at the center of the house. Okay? See, the z-axis is intersecting the house roughly in the center point of the house. Okay? So the observer is looking straight at the house. <coughs> and what we see here is a representation of the aligned, of the aligned environment. So we, we imagine a projection plane which is parallel to the xy axis, but it's located in front of the viewer. So to specify the location of the plane, we just need a distance f. So f is this distance from this distance along the z-axis from the viewer to the projection plane. Now we are free to choose f to be whatever it is. Okay. So we can adjust f, but we pos position the projection plane uh, between the viewer and the objects that we want to want to project. And then we simply imagine these. Projectors. So from every vertex in the environment, so we, all, we, we only have to work out the projections of the vertices. Because then we can join up vertices to give the projections of whatever polygons there are. So from each vertex in the world, we have a straight line. So remember when I talked about the thing, we, we think of the pupil as a single point. The pupil here is at the origin. So we just have these radii all these radiuses and the point in the real environment back to the origin. And all we need to do is just figure out where each of these lines intersect the projection plane. Okay? Because where they intersect the projection plane, that's where I will have drawn my marker when I was looking at the object in, 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 in the real environment. Okay? So you can see the, the projected image of the house there on the projection plane. And all the vertices of the projected image, they're all lying on these projector lines <coughs> that go from the real ver the vertex of the real environment back to back to the origin. Okay. So if we want the computer to be able to do this, we need to give it a matrix to carry this out. Okay? Or we need to figure out what the matrix is. Okay. So let's just set up the notation here. So we We've got a point with position vector r 
And so R is coordinates x, y, z, and 1, so it's got represented in homogeneous coordinates. And this is the projection matrix. Looks pretty simple. And it only depends on that one parameter, f. So f is the distance of the, proje of the projection plane from, from, from the origin. Okay. Again, f looks pretty much like, well, kind of looks like the 4x4 four four identity matrix, except it's now it's missing the 1 in the final position than the diagonal. And this coming left of the bottom right corner, so in the, in the fourth row, in the third column, we've got this quantity 1 over f. Now, when you multiply your vector r by that matrix, that will transform your vector r into these coordinates. So r, to begin with, has coordinates x, y, z, 1. But now it has coordinates x, y, z, z over f. So z over f is now the new homogeneous coordinate. And the first three coordinates x, y, z are the same. Now remember, <coughs> when we introduced homogeneous coordinates, we interpreted the fourth coordinate as a kind of a scaling coordinate. So we said that the convention was whenever you had homogeneous coordinates x, y, z, s, the point, that, the point in three dimensions that these coordinates were representing, you have to divide the first three coordinates by the scaling factor s. So when you do that with this projected point, projected vector r there on the right, you get coordinates, well, x over s, y over s, z over s. So when you do it with our projected, with our p times r, you get the three coordinates xf over z, yf over z, and f. So the point r has been transformed to a point. It's still in the three-dimensional environment. But it's now got z coordinate f. So that means it's lying somewhere on the xy plane located at position z equals f. So it is on the projection plane. And its x and y coordinates have changed now. So xf over z is the x coordinate, and yf over z is the y coordinate. So is this the correct, is this the correct one? So we need to, con you know, is that the correct projection matrix? So again, we just want to sketch it out carefully and just satisfy ourselves that what's going on here with this matrix multiplication and the, interpret the interpreting using the homogeneous coordinates convention, but this does actually produce the, the point with the correct coordinates. Okay. So we'll do that now. And again, we can, we can confirm this with, uh, with our overhead and side views of the environment. Exercise 7.2. Well, we did the overhead view before, so let's do the side view this time. What do I mean by a side view? So a side view is when, you see, the diagram on page 48 is an attempt to represent the full three dimensions of the setup. So let's not, because we want to work exactly, we'll just represent two of the dimensions. So we'll look at the y. The y, z plane. I just noticed in, in that diagram, 7.3, I've actually got my axis labels wrong. X and y need to be swapped around. You see that? Y should be the vertical coordinate, and x should be the horizontal coordinate. It's in figure 7.3. So the y and x labels on the coordinate axes need to be interchanged there. I probably wouldn't have noticed it. Um, okay, so what are we seeing in the side view? Well, in the side view, in the side view, we're seeing the y and z axes. So you might like if, if this is the projection plane we're talking about. The origin is here, somewhere hovering this side of the projection plane. So the house we're looking at is down over that side. So looking at it from the side, I can see the y and the y and z axis. So the projection screen is here on the x, y, no, the projection plane is somewhere here. So this thing here is the projection plane. It's a plane parallel to the x and y axes. 
certainly parallel to the y-axis, and the x-axis is coming up straight towards you. Um, and this is located at a distance f along the z-axis. So that's this quantity f. Um, so here's my point r out in the world somewhere, and it has coordinates x, y, z. One. Now we're looking at the y and z plane. So this is the z or the z value for r, and this is the y value. At the projector line, the eye looking at this environment is, is here at the origin. <coughs> The projector line is the line coming straight from the point in the real world back to back to the pupil of this eye in the observer. Yeah. And so this is the point. This point here is your R prime. This is the point on the projection plane. What point is that? Well, it's point along this hypotenuse line, or this projector line. The gradient of this line, the gradient so the gradient of the projector line in the yz plane, the gradient of what we're looking at is, well, it is um, y over z. y over z. Okay, so the gradient of that line, so the line is going from the point in the yz plane with coordinates yz back to the origin. So that projector line, line from the people out to the point R, that has gradient y over z, but we want to project it to this point here, which is distance f along the z-axis. So the, the point R prime, the projection of it, has y coordinate, second coordinate, equal to f y over z. We want to just see that position f along the z-axis, so it's going to have coordinate f, f y over z. As required, this agrees with agrees with what was represented by the matrix multiplication in the notes. The fact that this quantity, from looking at the geometry of the setup, the geometry of where the, the projection plane is, where the point was, and looking at the projector line, this gives the same coordinate that comes out of the matrix multiplication using the given matrix in the notes. And again, similarly, a top view, similarly, an overhead view. An overhead view of this setup showing the XZ plane will confirm the first coordinate of R prime as being F times X over Z. But just in this, in the same way, the y coordinate came out as being f y over z, so so the x coordinate would come out as being f z f x over z. Okay. 
Hey, any, uh, any, uh... So actually, I think what I'll do now is show you the kind of interactive model of this. So I kind of got on the computer an interactive model of figure 7.3, which just kind of, I mean, I think the figure 7.3 does a pretty good job of getting it across, but uh, we'll have a look at the computer demonstration as well. And then there's a couple of things in, in section 7.5 in the notes there on page 49. There's a couple of problems set up, so-called uh, vanishing points and the uh, back projection uh, problem, which we'll look at. Uh, I'll look at those in the second section. Look at those before I show you the skeleton file then for the... Uh, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Like display, internal display. There we go. That's better. That's better. Look at that. Look at it. Okay, now I've done this in Sage, but you could do certainly do reproduce this kind of thing in MATLAB as well, but I just kind of like the, the interface is a bit nicer in, uh, in, in Sage. So what, basically what we're going to try and do, I'll just quickly talk you through what the commands are, and I'll share this uh, worksheet with you afterwards, so if you, you can certainly get this and experiment around with it um, uh, yourselves. Um, So these first couple of commands sets up, so we're going to build up an interactive version of figure 7.3. So the first thing I'm just going to sh show is show an empty box and show the projection plane uh, as soon as this decides to execute for me. Loading in 3D scene. Here it is. Okay. Now, In order to, to look at this, we'll have to suspend our disbelief for the moment. So obviously you're looking at a you you are looking here at some kind of perspective projection. You're looking at some kind of 3D object that's being projected to the screen. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to suspend our disbelief. So we'll 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 actually pretend that we're looking at, you know, this this spinning cube is actually in the room spinning in front of us. So what we're actually looking at is a real three-dimensional object. Okay? So this is a representation of the world. I've got the origin. This dot in the middle is the origin. So that's going to be the viewpoint. And the, the opaque blue sheet there, that's going to be the projection screen. Okay. So you know, even though it is just living on the screen, for the purpose of this presentation, think of this object really here spinning around in front of us. Okay. So I want to stick a house in. Well. I'm not going to use a house. I'm going to use something a bit simpler. Uh, use a cube. So if you want to, you know, you can mess around with this yourself and use more complicated objects. But here I just set up a load of uh, coordinates for vertices of the cube. 
And then I define the cube edges as just pairs of vertices. So these define each of the edges that I want to draw. It's just from one vertex to another. Then I have a little for loop here, which says for every edge in cube edges, so this means for every pair of vertices, this P plus equals, this construction plus equals set is shorthand for P equals P plus something. So this adds a line. The line just goes from one vertex to the other one. So it just kind of plots lines for all of the edges, or adds all the lines to the plot, and then we'll have a look at the, the scene again. So here's, here's our version of figure 7.3, okay? So instead of a house, we're just talking about a cube, and <coughs> the blue dot is the origin, and the blue screen, that's the projection point. Okay? So this is like what I thought of as you know, if we could bring in a big sheet of glass for me to draw the outline of what we can see. Well, this is what this is what we're going to do now. Now, these lines, again, it's another for loop, and look at the main part of it. It's a for loop that goes through every vertex in the cube vertices, and for every vertex in cube verts. And what it does is it just implements the perspective projection. Sorry. Because what does it say? It forms a new set proj vertex, which is going to be the projected vertices. And the x coordinate is f times the old x coordinate times the z coordinate. It's vertex naught divided by vertex 2. In, in Sage, as in most computer languages, Array indexing begins at zero. In, in MATLAB, array indexing by default begins at one. But in most other computer languages, the default is that the first position in a vector is the zeroth position. So the z vertex zero is the x coordinate, vertex two is the z. So the new x coordinate is f times the old x coordinate divided by the z coordinate. The new y coordinate is f times the old y coordinate divided by the old z. And the third coordinate, z, is set to f for all of the vertices. So, so that's actually carrying out the perspective projection. So that gets me a new set of vertices called uh, proj cube verts, projected cube vertices. Uh, we just have a look at those vertices. So they've got various fractional values in the x and y coordinate. You can see they've all got z coordinate 2. The third coordinate of all these projected vertices is two, so so they're all living on the they're all living on the x y plane located at z equals two. Z equals two is the projection. Now I'm going to add so, so I have a new set of vertices which are just living on the projection plane. Now I'm going to draw in all the edges, and I'm going to color them green instead. And now I'm going to look at the plot. So again, pretend that you're actually seeing this three-dimensional world actually in the room. So the black cube is the real object, the blue dot is the origin, and there on the projection plane you can see the green, uh, the green projected version of the cube. And if you imagine looking straight at it, it does look, the green image, does look like a perspective version of the of the cube. The, the face closest to you is a large square, and the back face of the cube, the, the face of the cube that's furthest away from you, is a smaller, smaller square inside inside the larger, nearer face. Okay? But that green image, as you can see, it's just a two-dimensional image living on the projection plane. Now the real interesting thing I think which ties it all together. See, if I zoom in on this, straight in like this, remember the blue dot is the origin. So the blue dot is where the actual viewer's eye is. Now, if we're zooming in on it, well, actually what I'm doing, if you think of this thing as actually being in the room, is I'm sending this big cube, the cube being the boundary of the environment there, I'm sending it out closer to your eye. And as you get closer and closer, of course, the, the dot representing the origin grows bigger and bigger. And you see, at that you see, it, disappear. it disappears from this view because I've moved past it, you see. 
But just at that instant, it's kind of hard to do with a nice touchpad, but just at this instant here, just before it disappears, <laughs> I keep on going back to reduce the sensitivity. Just before it disappears, okay, I, I won't mess around with it anymore. Here is just at the point where the origin is disappearing. So that means the viewpoint, it's positioned exactly at your pupil. Okay, because I've moved the whole, I've transported the whole thing towards you. So now your eye is located at the origin. And as you can see, the projected green version of the cube exactly corresponds with what your eye is seeing as the real cube. You can't see the two, you can't see the real book black cube as being separate from the green projected cube, because one is lying completely over the other one. So that exactly illustrates the idea, the explanation I gave you before of bringing a glass, a pane of glass in front of me and me tracing around on the glass exactly what I perceive in the world, and then what's left on the glass is the prospective projected image. Well, you're, you're, you're seeing that exactly here, because the origin is located now exactly at your pupil, more or less. Okay? And we can enhance this a little bit by adding a second cube. So I, I make a copy of the first cube by translating it slightly. Add that one to the scene. Calculate its projection. Add the projected lines. And so now when we look at this, I get a second copy of the, of the thing. You see a second cube upwards and to the side of the first one, and we can also see its projection onto the projection plane. So you see in the world that the second cube is to the side of and above the original cube, and there is its red projected version onto the, onto the projection plane. And again, you get, the same, you get the same feature with this, that when you zoom into it, when you zoom into it so that the origin disappears, meaning your eye is more or less exactly at the origin, more or less there, that point there, more or less then the project, the green and the red cubes exactly overlie, not exactly there, it's because not at the exact correct position, but they exactly overlie from the viewpoint of the origin, the projected version is exactly what the origin, how the origin perceives the real object seems to see. And lastly, I add all the projector lines in. So this is now a fully, a full version replicating figure 7.3. And it kind of ties it all together. So now you can see the real objects in the, in the real environment, the projector lines going from the vertices to the origin. And you see they all intersect perfectly with their projected versions onto the projection. Okay. So I'll share that with you in the comments to the recording. You can go in and edit it around. You can enhance the objects, make them more complicated. And the same code should work, should uh, produce those nice projected images. And it basically just ties all the maths together that we've been doing there and just illustrates it all, and you have this way of kind of visually uh, confirming it there. Okay.